Hi, everyone. I'm Rosemary Barton here in Ottawa. Welcome to our special coverage on CBC News Network and streaming right around the world on the CBC News app and, of course, on our website. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will once again deliver an update very soon at the top of the hour, so in a couple moments' time, about his government's uh, response to COVID-19. Uh, we are expecting today to hear more about uh, procurement. Uh, he'll, will, he likes to give us sort of a weekly update now on how procurement is going for this country, whether it be people PPE or uh, other equipment that is coming in. We are also expecting the Prime Minister to get questions about a bill to be tabled tomorrow that will make some changes to the pandemic benefit programs that the government brought in uh, since March. One section or, or piece of that legislation has to do with the CERB, that is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It's coming under some criticism today uh, by the NDP and its leader, Jagmeet Singh. Um, that legislation suggests now that the government would in fact, go after anyone who had um, wrongly applied for the CERB and impose some penalties on those people. And the NDP says that that is not fair. They're also pushing the government to um, extend the CERB by as much as four months um, to make sure that Canadians who are still waiting for uh, their work to return or having a hard time finding a job have some additional support. Um, the Prime Minister may also give us some updates today on the wage subsidy program which continues to uh, not have as much uptake as the government would have liked. Uh, there's the Prime Minister's front door. We're going to wait for him to emerge. We've got about a minute <laughs> before he comes out the front door. Uh, so I'll just quickly bring in my colleagues, the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, and the CBC's David Cochran. Over to you, Vashi. Might even be shorter than that. Just yeah, got a 30-second notice. I think, <laughs> 30 I think the seconds, big thing, yeah. I think we're really interested in seeing this bill that you highlighted, <laughs> Rosie. Uh, we've had a chance to look through parts of it, especially the part about uh, penalties. That is not the message the government had given so far, but it, they've also set, added the caveat if, there, if you didn't have the intent to defraud the government, uh, you know, you, you'll just have to pay it back. If there is, you know, intent as described in the bill, I don't know how they're going to measure that, but they are talking about penalties now, and that's something the NDP is very opposed to and could predicate their support or lack thereof of this bill going forward. They need that support because both the Bloc and the Conservatives have said they're not into it. Yeah, and the Conservatives have been uh, pushing very hard for some sort of move to uh, make sure that people who are claiming the CERB want to go back to work. Here's the Prime Minister of Canada. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. When this crisis began, our government announced a plan to mobilize the industrial sector so that we could quickly produce, right here in Canada, the items that we need. Since then, businesses uh, right across the country have been volunteering to help us, and every week we are making significant progress. I want to begin today with an update. First, we signed a contract with GL Chemtech of Oakville to ensure the supply of chemicals that are critical for testing. As things start to reopen in Canada, we have to tighten up other measures, such as testing and contact tracing. Therefore, we have to ensure that our health care professionals have the right tools to administer more tests and analyze them. We also signed two new contracts to make sure our frontline workers can continue to do their jobs safely. Joseph Ribkoff, a clothing manufacturing based out of Dorval, will be providing us with 1.2 million made in Canada medical gowns with deliveries starting in July and the Stevens Company, a medical supply distributor in Brampton, will be supplying 15 million shoe covers as well as 5 million disinfectant wipes, all made in Canada. Over the past few months, our government has helped companies retool their manufacturing facilities and massively scale up production to meet the demands of this crisis. I want to thank every entrepreneur and every worker who stepped up to contribute to this fight. As we start to reopen and some people head back to work, the need for personal protective equipment and other essential supplies like hand sanitizer and disinfectant will continue to grow. <clears throat> and we're making sure we're ready for that. On Saturday, a ship carrying 160,000 litres of hand sanitizer arrived in Vancouver and we're expecting seven more ships with hand sanitizer in the coming days. We also have almost a million sh face shields and more than seven million pairs of gloves on their way to the provinces and territories. 
and to connect businesses looking for PPE with suppliers. Today, we're launching a PPE Supply Hub website. We also created new, innovative procurement streams to allow more businesses to develop solutions and products Canadians need because of this pandemic. We've always known that Canada is home to some of the best innovators in the world, and it's been great to see so many of them use their talent and know-how to help our communities during this crisis. In April, we put out a call asking for creative, made-in-Canada prototypes that will help current and future outbreaks of COVID-19 and similar public health emergencies. And in just two weeks, we received over 550 proposals. We will soon be selecting some prototypes for testing, and innovators will be able to work with the government to scale up production. After spending several months at home, life is slowly starting to return to normal. Of course, we have to remain very vigilant and continue to follow public health care advice. But some businesses can start to reopen, and that is good news. Neighborhood businesses, small businesses are playing an essential role in our communities, and we have missed them during confinement. And now it's time to encourage them as much as possible, while being careful and wearing a mask if need be. The recovery presents a number of challenges for business owners. After closing their doors for a number of months, many are having trouble starting up their activities again and rehiring their employees because they have liquidity problems. get ready to reopen, more employers are using the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to rehire their employees. Just take Track and Trail in Edmonton. Track and Trail was well established in the community, selling outdoor clothing, equipment and footwear for 36 years. When the pandemic hit, they had to close down their stores. After a number of challenging months, they are now ready to welcome customers again. And as part of getting their shops back up and running, they used the wage subsidy to help rehire their employees. Shops, local entrepreneurs and business owners are the backbone of our economy. They make our towns and cities better places to call home. And collectively, they are the largest employer in the country. As we start to reopen, some businesses will need support to get back on their feet and our government will be there to help with programs like the emergency wage subsidy. I also want to remind people that we launched a hotline service to help entrepreneurs and small business owners, including not-for-profit organizations and charities, navigate these uncertain times. People with pressing financial needs can now call 1-866-989-1080 to speak with an accountant or a business advisor. I want to close this morning by reminding all business people that we now have a hotline to help them come through this uncertain time. Businesses and entrepreneurs, including non-profits, will now be able to call 1-866-989-989. 1080 to receive assistance from an accountant or a financial advisor. During this pandemic, our government has been there for Canadians every step of the way, and we will continue to propose measures to support them. On Saturday, we shared draft legislation with the opposition parties, which included additional proposals to help people. This legislation will aim to provide direct support to people with disabilities, support more workers through the wage subsidy, and ensure that Canadians who aren't able to meet certain judicial timelines, such as bankruptcy, aren't unfairly punished. We will also strive to make CERB payments more flexible, while making sure that those who knowingly and wrongfully claim the CERB face consequences. Discussions are ongoing but I fully expect us to be able to work well with the opposition to deliver this important support to Canadians. The coming weeks will be busy as we start to see activities uh, resume. But as always, you can count on our government to, to support you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. We will start the period of questions by the phone today. Operator, it's to you. Thank you. Thank you. For questions, star one. For the question, étoile one. First question, Michel Lamarche, TVA. À vous. 
Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Good morning, J'aimerais Mr. Trudeau. Vous entendre I'd like you to comment on this uh, NDP proposal to extend the CERB by four months. Is that a possibility, or should we assume that uh, that uh, will stop for the people who've been receiving it in the last few weeks? I think it is important to understand that at every step of the way, we are looking at what the proper measures uh, are to help people and what exactly we need to do to restart our economy. The CERB was introduced to help people who no longer had any income, who had lost their jobs because of COVID-19, and it has helped more than 8 million Canadians. Of course, in an economy that's uh, functioning on all cylinders uh, in the next few months, we won't need the CERB. But that transition period, uh, and, and now we're starting to restore, restart uh, businesses and certain sectors of the economy, there are still some three million people out there who don't have a job and who would like one. So we know that we'll have to look at how we can end the CERB and transfer people to the wage subsidy and how we can introduce uh, the right measures to restart the economy. And those are the discussions that are underway right now between us in government, but also with other parties. Now, as you say, this is an issue we have to follow closely, and we're open to all kinds of suggestions. Follow up? As you know, Michelle, the uh, wage, uh, sorry, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was brought in to help those millions of Canadians who lost their jobs because of the pandemic uh, and needed support to be able to pay their rent, to pay, their, pay for their groceries, to support their families. And we did that. Obviously, as the economy starts to reopen, there will be more and more people going back to work. Uh, more and more companies will choose to take the wage subsidy, uh, and therefore people will be leaving the CERB to get onto that because people can start working and be connected to a job uh, even while they get income support. Uh, but obviously, with around 3 million people unemployed and looking for work, uh, it is going to be a while before we get enough jobs uh, to consider that things are back to normal. So we're looking very carefully at how we will uh, move forward uh, with the package of measures that we've put forward in a way that makes sense to both encourage people uh, to get back to work, encourage companies uh, to get going again, while at the same time supporting and protecting those people who uh, cannot work because of, uh, because of the pandemic. So we're going to continue our discussions both internally and with other parties to get this right for Canadians. A follow-up, Michel? Yes. Should we understand from this that there will be changes made to the CERB, particularly initiatives to help people return to work in the coming months? And I'd like you to comment on fraudsters. Why did you change your idea about that? Well, first of all, yes, there will be changes made to all of our programs as the pandemic evolves and the situation in Canada uh, goes back to normal. So we will certainly be adjusting our pro programs to meet uh, the needs of communities and Canadians uh, and families right across the country. So we will continue to do that as we've been doing right from the outset to uh, change things as we go along. But with respect to the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, we decided right at the beginning to send the money out to as many people as possible. If we, if we had made things too complicated in terms of applying for the benefit and if we had ensured there were a lot of checks before people could get it, we could never have got those checks out within a few weeks to millions of Canadians who desperately needed that money. But we also knew that that uh, would mean that after the fact we would have to introduce measures to correct any mistakes and uh, act on fraud, which unfortunately uh, occurs in many different circumstances. So obviously, if there are people who made a mistake, who applied for the CERB and the wage subsidy, they will have to pay back one of the two. But they will not be punished if they made a mistake where there was so much uncertainty at the time. At the same time, we need to have concrete measures 
measures in place uh, to address the small minority of criminals who took advantage of this pandemic and a period of extreme difficulty in our society uh, to collect this benefit unfairly. And we have to have measures in place uh, to do that about deliberate fraud. The Canada Emergency uh, Response Benefit was put in place in a way that we knew would maximize the speed with which it would reach the millions of Canadians that needed it. That's why we didn't put a tremendous amount of complicated checks and background checks and verifications up front because we needed to flow that money quickly to the millions of Canadians who uh, had no more paychecks and didn't know how they were going to pay for their groceries or their rent. And that's what we did. But we always knew from the beginning that uh, there would be mistakes and indeed that there would be a small number of fraudsters who would try to take advantage of it. Now, there may be a number of people who uh, mistakenly took both the CERB and the wage subsidy because they weren't sure what they were going to do and they were really worried and they just took everything. Those people will simply have to pay back uh, the one that they uh, shouldn't have been taken and we're not looking at punishing people who made honest mistakes. Obviously, this is a time for us to pull together as a country. But unfortunately, in every situation, there are a few criminals uh, who will deliberately try to take advantage of a moment of uh, solidarity, a moment where we're in crisis and we're trying to help each other out by deliberately frauding the system. And as I said, defrauding the system. And as I said from the very beginning, uh, we will make sure that we are punishing people who try to take advantage uh, of this situation. Uh, and we've put measures in place that will allow us to go after the deliberate fraudsters who are trying to game the system for, uh, for criminal benefits. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Ryan Timothy, National Post. Line open. Yeah, good morning, sir. I'm, I'm wondering, several of the opposition parties have said that as part of their support, they, they want to see a fiscal update from the government. Uh, you didn't have a budget this year for obvious reasons, but I'm wondering why uh, we're not going to see a fiscal update or if we're going to see a fiscal update before the end of uh, Parliament sitting. We've continued, Ryan, to demonstrate openness and transparency on all the measures we've put forward. Uh, we've answered questions on all of them, both from the opposition, from uh, press conferences like these. And we've announced all the measures we're putting forward, and uh, there has been a tremendous amount of transparency. The challenge with fiscal updates is uh, a part of a core part of that is predicting what things are going to look like for the rest of the year and for the coming years. And obviously in this situation, uh, any predictions we make will be wildly unreliable, uh, even from one week to, a next, to the next. Uh, we're uh, you know, grappling to understand what exactly the Canadian economy is doing in this unprecedented situation. We will, however, continue to look at ways of being open and transparent with Canadians about the measures we've put forward, about our expectations uh, for the coming weeks. And uh, that kind of transparency is just what Canadians expect, and we'll be working with Canadians on that. Okay. Uh, I think people know that we have been transparent since the very beginning of this crisis with all the measures we introduce for Canadians. We are regularly taking uh, media questions, uh, questions from the opposition, and sharing our investments uh, with the Finance Committee so that people can see exactly how we're uh, taking action in this pandemic. The challenge... <laughs> The challenge with uh, economic updates is that an integral part of those updates is a prediction of what's going to be happening between now and the rest of the year. And of course, we're in a situation which is totally uncertain, where we ourselves have trouble understanding what's going to happen in a month or two, let alone in two or three years. So we will continue to seek some way of being transparent with Canadians, but uh, people People must not expect we'll have an absolutely clear idea of what's going to happen on January 1st, 2021. It's still extremely uncertain, and our priority remains to be here now to support people as they need that help. 
Yeah, sir. I'm, I'm wondering, though, the, the parliamentary budget officer has been able to make projections. You've been able to cost all of your programs to date. I, I know what you're saying about the unpredictability of the Canadian economy, but, you know, next week you're going to ask Parliament to approve $87 billion in new spending. Wouldn't it be beneficial to have a best guess of, of where that's going to put the country's um, debt and deficit? Uh, we have been, obviously, in the Parliamentary Budget Officer and at Finance Committee. We've been tallying up uh, the costs and the expenses and the investments that we've been making to support Canadians through this. But establishing or laying out the state of our economy when our economy is, for the large part, frozen or in a coma, like right now, you know, most or so many businesses and uh, economic activity is simply suspended. It's not gone. It's not never coming back. It's not. Uh, it's not. You know, quietly going along slowly. It's just in suspension. And to know what's going to happen when it restarts uh, is extremely uncertain. So we will continue to be open and transparent about all sorts of things in terms of what we're doing and how much we're spending and what our, our path looks like, what our expectations for that spending in the coming uh, weeks looks like. But a fiscal update that talks about you know, what our projected revenues or expenditures could be uh, six months from now or a year from now uh, would be incredibly unreliable because we just don't know what the impact of this pandemic is on uh, the, the, the sum total of the Canadian economy because we are suspended right now. La réalité, c'est que the de créer des prévisions that, sur ce que notre uh, économie pourrait avoir l'air, like uh, it, it starts up again. Well, the fact is, is we don't know because our businesses, our entrepreneurs, and organizations, our businesses, our entrepreneurs and organizations across the country are really at a standstill right now. Will they reopen at uh, half capacity, three quarters capacity, or fully? Will they simply disappear? So the fact is, there will be many different situations that we see in the coming months as this pandemic progresses, if there's a second wave, and there will also be international impacts. So we will continue to be completely open and transparent about the expenditures we're making and what we expect to do in the coming months. But laying out the state of our economy now and what the state of our economy will be in a year or three years would be basing ourselves on estimates and random choices. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Mélanie Marquis, La Presse, à vous. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. Coming back to the bill that will be introduced tomorrow, some opposition politicians have been saying that you would be penalizing even further rationalized and indigenous communities. What do you answer that? How do you answer that criticism? Well, I understand that concern, but I can tell you that is absolutely not the intent of this bill. With this bill, first of all, what we want to do is help Canadians, Canadians uh, living with disabilities. We want to give them money. We want to ensure that more businesses can qualify for the wage subsidy. We want to ensure that we are helping more people through this legislation. But the fact is that we're also looking at new measures to deal with fraudsters who deliberately decided to take advantage of of the system at a time when everyone is in a crisis and a little bit vulnerable. So we do not want to, and it is not our intention, to penalize people who make mistakes. But we must have a system that uh, is rigorous and can uh, and deal with criminals. But I'm looking forward to working with the other parties to address their concerns and perhaps make changes to this bill in order to improve the way it helps Canadians and protects the integrity of our system. Follow-up? Yes. With respect to the CERB, 
Mr. Trudeau, I may be mistaken, but it seems to me in, we, in recent weeks you were signaling that it would be ending soon. Today, you say that you're open to an extension or some adjustments to the program. What has changed uh, since you first uh, introduced it? Well, from the very beginning, we knew that the CERB would be there to help people who are not not working, not at the job, and as the economy started up again and people could go back to work, we would need it less and less. But with the kind of job losses we've been seeing, three million Canadians out there are seeking a job and can't find one. So we know that we will need it for some time yet. The wage subsidy will not be there to help every single person who lost a job. So we are currently looking at how we can make that transmi transition to a, an economy starting to reopen with businesses uh, claiming the wage subsidy instead. But there are many people who still can't work because of COVID-19 and need direct support. Operator, dernière question, téléphone. Merci. Thank you. Prochaine question, Lina Dib, La Presse canadienne. À vous. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. I was uh, surprised. I thought it was over. I'd like to come back to the CERB and the bill you'll be tabling Wednesday. As I understand it, when you say that you want to address the small minority of criminals who are abusing, I presume you're saying they're not the type of people Mr. Singh is referred to. Well, we have a system that has to be based on integrity, that has to be rigorous. In a pandemic like that, we want to be there for our neighbors. People are helping each other, and they would not like to see people who deliver deliberately decide to exploit and, and defraud the system, uh, where initially we decided to get that money out the door and do the checks afterwards. We wanted the system to be fair, of course, and in that context we have to look at all situations and look at these uh, things case by case, but we have to have a rigorous system to ensure that we are helping the right people. Follow up? Yes, I understand. And with respect to the transition from the CERB to the wage subsidy, I know you said that you wanted people to use the wage subsidy more, but thus far that hasn't really worked very well. Do you have a plan in place, or what exactly will you do to encourage people to move to the wage subsidy? I just want to correct you, Lena. Right from the outset, we knew that people needed the CERB. They, they had lost their jobs. The economy was at a standstill for two months and people no longer had an attachment to their job. There were thousands of people out there who were not receiving a paycheck anymore, and we needed to ensure that those people could stay home and they wouldn't be uh, trying to look for income one way or another in the midst of confinement. So the CERB was there for when the economy was completely shut down, and we wanted the economy to be shut down in order to protect people's health. But at the same time, now as the economy starts up again and as people return to work by remaining vigilant and being careful, of course, there will be a lot of people who will be going off the CERB to benefit from the wage subsidy instead or simply go back to their job. So as the situation evolves, there will be fewer and fewer people who will need the CERB and therefore we will be making changes to the system, but the system is uh, operating step by step uh, in the right way. Uh, Glenn McGregor, CTV News. Uh, Prime Minister, BNN Bloomberg is reporting this morning that finance officials are preparing to deliver a fiscal update sometime this summer. Uh, your government didn't deliver a federal budget this spring, um, and Canadians don't really have a clear picture of where the government finances are. Will you commit to delivering either a budget or a fiscal update before Labor Day? 
We have been open and transparent every step of the way about our investments, about uh, the measures we're taking to support Canadians. Uh, we've been presenting regularly at Finance Committee all of our uh, expenditures. We've been debating measures in the House. We've been taking questions from media, from uh, opposition parties every step of the way because transparency during a time of crisis is extremely important. And we will continue uh, to look for ways uh, to share with Canadians what we're doing, how we're helping them, and uh, what, uh, what kind of fiscal frame we find ourselves in. The challenge with any fiscal update is, as the economy starts up again, it's very difficult to know what that will look like. We can certainly have a range of projections that will vary widely, depending on you know, how uh, many businesses reopen and to what percentage. Are restaurants going to be half full? Are, are they going to rehire? Are they going to shut down and go bankrupt? Uh, are uh, people going to start going out again and shopping? Are they going to uh, you know, hunker down for the summer in their, in their cabins or at home and, and not go out? I mean, there are so many things that we simply don't know that make Making projections about what our economy could look like six months from now or a year from now uh, would be an exercise in, uh, in invention and imagination. Obviously, we need to continue to be transparent and concrete about everything we're doing and uh, forecast what kind of expenditures we're going to have in the coming weeks and months. Uh, but a proper fiscal update uh, is something that, that you know, includes usually projections on three to five years in the future that we simply don't know about. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has produced a uh, deficit projection of $260 billion. I don't think that's, he would consider that invention or imagination. Um, but regardless of what that figure is exactly, future governments are going to have to carry that debt. The servicing costs on that are going to be very high. Sorry? The, the servicing costs on the debt that you're going to have to carry, that you're, you're adding to now, right? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. Uh, okay, but it's still a lot of money. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's still a lot that, of money. No, no. It, and, and you don't that, know where... The, okay, so... so, so but but how, how are you going to pay for that? How okay. are you going to pay for those costs in, in future years? Are you going to increase taxes or are you going to uh, cut programs? Okay. Right now, we're in an absolutely unprecedented situation where our economy had to completely shut down. And the government chose to and needed to be there for people while they lost their paychecks, while uh, they could not uh, you know, be comfortable in how they were going to be able to support their families, pay their rent, pay for their groceries. We put forward measures to support Canadians right across the country so that we could stay healthy and so that we could have an economy to come back to as soon as the opportunity arose. We have been absolutely transparent every step of the way about these investments we're making for Canadians, about how we are supporting millions of Canadians, millions of, of people, thousands upon thousands of small businesses across this country get through this unprecedented time. Canada went into this crisis with a far better fiscal position than just about any other G7 country. And uh, we are coming through it extremely well as well. The investments we're making that will allow Canada to bounce back strongly from this uh, are the kinds of things that we needed to do during this pandemic. And as we move forward, uh, because of historically low interest rates, the debt servicing costs will be low. But we will need to uh, look very carefully at how we, uh, we uh, remain fiscally responsible as we move forward. But the best thing to focus on is ensuring that Canadians can come back from this strongly, that they can get back to work, that they can reopen their stores and their businesses, that they have confidence once again in our economy and our future. And those are the things that we need to do, needed to do in the short term in order for us to have a long term for our Canadian economy. We were facing an unprecedented crisis where thousands of Canadians were in a situation where they no longer had any income, they no longer had a paycheck to buy groceries or pay their rent or care for their family. 
We had a duty as a government, and we made the choice of helping them. Because in order to get through this crisis, this health crisis, so that we could eventually bounce back very strongly when the crisis was over, we needed to make immediate investments to help Canadians. And the best way of having a healthy economy in the coming years was to ensure that people could get through the crisis, they could hang on, and that's exactly what this government decided to do. With historically low interest rates now, uh, the fact that the government decided to help Canadians as we did, well, that was the best way of minimizing the consequences and the costs of these measures for uh, years and decades to come. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. At the end of the 16-week period for the CERB, a, a lot of people will um, fall into a vacuum. They won't have access to the wage subsidy, they won't know what to do, and they won't have a job. What can you say to those people who are feeling tremendous uncertainty now, they don't know what the transition will be, perhaps you could explain to them what measures you are considering now. Would it be a more targeted and flexible CERB? Would it be the return to an employment insurance program? Could you give us some indications, please? From the very beginning, we have said, as a government, that we would be there for people, that we would there be there to support them. We created the CERB to help thousands of Canadians who had lost their jobs. And even if the economy is starting to reopen now, we are fully aware of the fact that not all jobs will be coming back right now. People will continue to need help, and we will be making announcements in the coming days that will explain exactly how we're going to help them, but I can reassure people right away that as a government, we will continue to be there to help you, to support you in the midst of this crisis. Now, on the question of fraud, will there be additional staff brought in to do those checks, and who will do them? Because if you're announcing penalties such as this, uh, I mean, that may be a bit of a smokescreen if there's no one there to, you know, actually apply them. Well, from the very beginning, we introduced uh, new staffing and brought in new staff in order to, able, to be able to get that money out the door and apply the CERB the way it was supposed to be applied. We have been working with an extraordinary public service that has done an outstanding job right across the country in delivering these programs to ensure that the integrity, integrity of the uh, program would be maintained and that there would be consequences for anyone trying to deliberately defend fraud the system. Good morning. You, you as a government, you talk about being transparent, you talk about using evidence to guide your policy make, uh, decisions. What evidence do you now have, what analysis have you done to look at wh why people are not transferring from the CERB to the wage subsidy and how to go forward uh, as the economy reopens? I think the important thing to understand was the wage, uh, sorry, the, the um, emergency response benefit was there to support people during the time, and is there to support people during this time of crisis when they lost their jobs because of COVID-19. They cannot work because of this pandemic through no fault of their own. And the government needs to be there to support them so they can continue to support their families, continue to pay rent and buy groceries. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit was created for the time when we were telling everyone, stay home, don't go to work, shut down your businesses, uh, keep your neighbours safe. It was there to replace revenue at a time where massive parts of the economy were completely shut down. And it serves and served its purpose extremely well and will continue to be necessary uh, until uh, we uh, move forward enough to get, to get to most people back to work. As people start getting back to work, as people start thinking about that link between employer and employee in businesses, small and large, right across the country, more and more businesses will start taking on that wage subsidy as a way of preparing and reopening. 
this is a natural progression of things from that moment of we need people to stay home and not collect paychecks to now we want you thinking about your job and reconnecting as different parts of the company, our uh, country, are reopening in a progressive way, uh, in a gradual way. So the transfer from most people on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit towards more and more people on the wage subsidy as the economy picks up again uh, is uh, exactly what we foresee and exactly how the system should work. Prime Minister Janet Silver, Global News. In mid-May, when we first heard reports um, that there was some fraud with, uh, fraud with CERB, you discounted the abuse, saying that it was probably just a few people among millions of Canadians who are applying for this benefit. But now you're bringing in legislation that will fine or imprison people for fraudulent claims. I'm just wondering what specifically changed in the last three weeks to change your thinking to push for this? Uh, the thinking hasn't changed at all. We always knew that the choice we had to make with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was minimizing the amount of paperwork and verification up front so that it could flow rapidly to the millions of people who needed it. But we knew at the same time that there would be mistakes made, you know, good faith, honest mistakes that we would need to clean up afterwards and make sure that people paid back if they got both the wage subsidy and the response benefit, for example. And there's no harm, no foul on that if it's an honest mistake. But unfortunately, we also knew that, as with any system, there would be a very small minority, as I pointed out, of people who deliberately try to take advantage of the system. And we need to make sure, we need to make sure that we have the tools to be able to assure the integrity of the system. People's confidence in their institutions, people con people's confidence in how their tax dollars are spent and invested is really important. And people need to know that uh, criminals who try to take advantage of a system, particularly at a time where we're pulling together as a country, where we're looking out for each other, where we're supporting each other, um, is still important. So uh, we're making sure that, that we do have the tools. Hopefully we will not have to use them very much at all because the vast majority of people are of good faith and just trying to support their families and trying to do the right things to get us all through this. But we do need the tools to go after those who deliberately choose to take advantage of people and systems vulnerability in a time of crisis. Hi, Prime Minister, Tom Perry, CBC. Uh, one of your MPs, Marwan Tabara from Kitchener, is uh, facing charges. He stepped back from your caucus. These charges date back to April. I'd like to know when you or your officials learned about them and what action you're going to be taking. Um, as, uh, as we said, um, I and uh, my office uh, only learned about uh, the serious charges uh, against this MP uh, on Friday. Uh, no one in my party or my organization knew anything about them until Friday. Uh, and when we found out about these serious charges, um, the correct steps were taken for uh, uh, Mr. Tabara to remove himself from the Liberal Party of Canada caucus. Um, that, is, uh, that is the measure that we have in place, um, and that is what we're doing. Okay. Uh, we only learned of those serious allegations on Friday as a party. Neither myself nor my office uh, were aware of that, uh, were aware of what had happened before that. Now, obviously, these are very serious allegations, and Mr. Tabara has uh, removed himself from the Liberal Party as uh, justice and takes its course. It's prepared to move ahead on body cameras. In your conversation uh, with, the, with the commissioner, was it you saying to the commissioner, this is something I want the RCMP to do? Was it the commissioner saying to you, this is something we should do? Where did the idea come from? Uh, it was uh, a conversation in which uh, it was raised as one of the things that people had been talking about, and the commissioner pointed out that there had been studies and uh, there had been pilot projects. Uh, there were concerns around the technology. There were concerns around uh, the logistics involved, uh, particularly in some of our more remote areas. Uh, and 
And there were, of course, uh, concerns around uh, the financial cost of this. Uh, but uh, in that discussion, it became clear that those were sort of practical challenges that could be resolved and uh, that it was uh, probably an idea that's, uh, that's time has come to, uh, for greater transparency. But of course, it is uh, only one measure amongst many, many things that we need to do to address uh, systemic challenges in this country to racialized and Indigenous Canadians. Um, there are uh, so many different things that we need to look at as a country to uh, take concrete action on, and that is something that we're engaged with, uh, not just uh, our justice system, uh, but uh, with uh, Canadians, uh, with organizations, with uh, different advocacy groups, uh, to look at how we can take this moment uh, to bring real action forward uh, to transform this country for the better. But who raised it, sir? Was it you or the commissioner? Um, I don't recall. It was a conversation in which it, it, came, it came together, it came up. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse aujourd'hui. Merci tout le monde. That's the Prime Minister of Canada on this uh, Tuesday giving us his uh, daily update on his government's response to COVID-19. Uh, let me just tell you, though, if you are wanting to know what's happening in Quebec, uh, you can look online uh, at uh, the Quebec Premier, François Legault. He is with public health officials in Quebec City updating the situation in that province. Quebec making more progress today, 138 new cases in the last 24 hours. That's the second day in a row now the province has reported under 200 cases. If you want to watch that, you can go to cbc.ca and stream it live. But to uh, wrap up a little bit of what the Prime Minister said there today, let me bring back Vashi and David. Uh, most of the, I would say the vast majority of the questions were about the CERB, Vashi, and uh, the government's uh, legislation and whether it plans to extend it and how it's going to move forward with some of these measures. Yeah, what happened is parts of this legislation, which has yet to be tabled, were leaked to the media, and the parts specifically are in reference to what we heard so many questions directed at the Prime Minister about, and that is the CERB. That's the benefit that the government introduced months ago. It lasts for four months. You get $2,000 a month, and, and the, the idea was to get the money out quickly, and, and it did get out very quickly. The bar for receiving it, you know, you just had to sort of check off a box online saying, I, you know, I made more than $5,000 last year. I'm not making more than $1,000 a month right now. And then the money would be transferred through your CRA account very quickly. What this legislation sets out is uh, penalties and a process by which the people who have uh, defrauded the system or who have intentionally mm -hmm. uh, decided to apply for it and receive that money because it was so easy to access uh, are punished for it. Now, the questions to the Prime Minister, I think, made a lot of sense because it wasn't as though the government signaled at the outset of this, you know, beware, there's a ton of big penalties coming your way if, if something goes wrong. And I, and I think that the, the Prime Minister was careful in his wording, and, and so have his ministers previously, and I think it's fair to say that they, you know, stress the idea that it's fraud, right? You're knowingly defrauding yes. the government yes. in this case. So it's not like you just made a mistake. I think the difficulty in a practical sense is discerning which is which, for right? Sure. Because for sure. a lot of people I heard of, and I'm, I'm I'm sure you did too. They were nervous about it, right? They were like, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if this particular thing makes me qualify or not, particularly, let's say, seniors who had made an income but also received a pension last year. Very worried about the possibility that they might not have access to this or, or shouldn't be getting it and they, will they have to pay it back? Uh, many times I've interviewed the Minister of Employment, Carla Qualtro, who really signaled this is not about punishment. And, the, and the, the Liberals took a lot of heat for that, actually, a few weeks ago. And some of our colleagues alluded to that in reporting through the National Post, which talked about a memo, for example, that went out saying, you know, don't stop payment, even if you think that there is fraud. Uh, and they insisted it's only a small segment of people applying and we'll work this out on the other end. Uh, and, and the Minister had been very clear that unless there's, you know, malicious intent, they had no plans to do anything but ask for that money to be paid back. So I think that there are questions, obviously, about how this is going to work in a practical sense. Will the legislation be amended? The NDP in particular is very critical of the idea of penalties on the other side of this, and they also want the CERB extended. And the Prime Minister gave no indication, really, that that was their intent at this point. Obviously, no. they're trying to work out what it looks like at the conclusion of the program, which is coming up pretty soon, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and how they transition away from it. But he certainly didn't say, you know, yes, we're going to extend 
extend it by four months, which is what the NDP explicitly wanted. I think that there is a discussion to be had about who actually will face some kind of punishment, uh, what that punishment is. Some of the details in the bill include, you know, thousands of dollars in fines, jail time, paying back double or triple the amount that you receive. So that is a pretty serious uh, cost to pay if you mm -hmm. are just, in fact, making a mistake. The prime minister was pretty explicit. You're not going to be punished if you're making a mistake. I think we need to see how that works in practice. Yeah, and I think the NDP's concern is that people uh, in a desperate situation yeah. uh, applied for it. Um, you know, maybe they shouldn't have, but they did anyway because they, they were very concerned about their financial well-being. Um, and now what could possibly happen? Yeah, I mean, so it's unclear. I agree with you how, how they go about doing that. Um, and it didn't sound, at least from what the prime minister was saying, that he believed it was a large number of people. But obviously, if people have uh, fraudulent taken uh, money that they shouldn't have taken uh, it, in any situation you would expect the government to go after them but it is as you said not exactly the same message that we've received throughout the past uh, three or four months David there were lots of questions too about a fiscal update which I found interesting because mm. um, while I understand the uncertainty in the economy I, I, I still uh, like my colleagues who asking the questions think there might be some value in painting a picture of where things are it didn't really sound like the Prime Minister was inclined to do that yeah, um, just to go back to the Serb thing, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure it's as unclear as people think. I mean, there are two essential elements to a crime, the criminal act, <clears throat> excuse me, and the criminal intent. Uh, if you panicked and applied for all of the aid measures and got more money than you were supposed to get because you're economically desperate, there's no real intent there to commit a crime. But me, who people have seen on TV every day throughout this, I'm still working, I'm getting a salary. If I applied for the money to get the money because I felt I could take advantage of the system, I know better. I am committing a crime. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think I should expect to be punished more than just pay it back. So I, I, I think once this is spelled out, I, I think that can become very clear in terms of what constitutes criminal intent. Because I think an economically desperate senior or a shift worker or a student who applied for something because they had bills due and didn't know what was going on and all the message was pay now, ask questions later. I, I, th I think it's pretty clear they're not going to go after those people. It's going to be people like you, us, who are working and have money and decided, hey, I can game the system because there's okay, no control. I didn't, I didn't apply for it, just for the record. <laughs> None of us right. did. Yeah. That she is I, staying I mean, silent, you, you, which you, is you, her you, right. You, know? you, you, <laughs> might, you might be right, but I, I, I do think those people uh, yeah. need that reassurance. They need a public sure. reassurance that if they made the mistake or if they claimed it because they just didn't know that and those people will be left And the Prime Minister said that in his yeah. answer, right? If you were yeah. panicked and freaking out and you applied and got more than you should have or should have gotten a different program than this, we're not coming after you. I, I think their whole philosophical approach to these programs is to put a floor under desperate, needy people. I don't think now they're going to take a hammer and smash out the floor on the desperate, needy people. It's more the people who, I, I think when you do the tax time reconciliation, because all of this is taxable income, you will get a very clear idea of who may have been playing games with the system and who you need the follow-up on. Now, the other question you asked on, on the fiscal update, uh, there are reports that finance is working on it. Uh, finance Finance may very well be doing that. It's the Prime Minister who publicly says there's really no need for this. And Bill Morneau has, has said that because any number you sort of put out there has to come with a massive disclaimer because sure. it's almost impossible to project economic activity with any rigor at the best of times, and this is certainly not the best of times. I mean, just look how wildly off the recent job numbers were in terms of what people were predicting and what actually happened. It just shows mm -hmm. a state of flux and volatility. So they could absolutely do a fiscal update to satisfy everybody, to put a benchmark on paper. and. In good, good fiscal governance, they probably should, uh, but people need to accept that a little bit like the modeling we've seen on the COVID mm -hmm, cases mm -hmm. and COVID deaths, it can change so rapidly uh, that you know it, it's almost out of date the minute it's printed and distributed widely. So, so that's the challenge there. There are a lot of questions on the economic consequence or the fiscal consequence, excuse me, of the heavy borrowing and the heavy spending the government is doing. You saw, you know, the, the Prime Minister and Glenn McGregor go at it a bit about the high costs and the debt servicing. Trevor Tome, who's an economist in Alberta, has done some, some pretty good work on McLean's today, if you want to go check that out. The $150 billion in borrowing, for example, uh, on the aid spending they've done, the interest rates for the government over 10 years are half a percentage point. Yep. So it's basically free. The interest cost on that over a decade yeah. is $7 billion. A lot of money for us, not a lot of money for a G7 economy. Yeah, I, I, I take your point. But given that it's taxpayers' money, it would be good to, for them to put out a chart so that we see all of that well, in there, one there place. Well, there are you charts know? on what yeah. each program costs yeah. and what they spent sure. and what the uptake sure. is, how that all fits together. 
if you do that next week, you're having to do it again in September, again in October, or maybe I'll again do, in I'll December. I'll do it. I'll take it every week myself. But that, <laughs> that's just the kind of you gal I am. People. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both very much. I appreciate it. Fashion will be back at five Eastern. And David Cochran, thanks. Uh, just before we go, I want to squeeze in this quick interview because this was some good welcome news yesterday for people. Families separated by the Canada-U.S. border shutdown. Uh, the prime minister announced that immediate family members of citizens and permanent residents will be allowed to enter the country. And Ashley Cook is a doctor in Windsor, Ontario. She's very very excited because her husband's also a doctor and he works in Michigan and she happens to be pregnant so she's elated that this has finally happened. Ashley, uh, Dr. Ashley Cook, how are you feeling about things? Um, I mean, I'm pretty excited but I'm also a little bit nervous about actually attempting to cross the border just because I feel like there's a lot of it's up to the discretion of the CBSA agent at the border that is, there's a lot of questions for me that are like up for interpretation. So I'm kind of nervous to actually try to even do the crossing or so have who, him do the crossing. Have him do the crossing, right. So so uh, when might he attempt this? When was the last time you saw each other? Uh, we last saw each other at the beginning of April because I actually was in the United States when the border shutdown happened. So I crossed back uh shortly thereafter so i haven't endured like the full three months like many people have but it's been long enough let me say yeah. that yeah that's still too long <laughs> and and you are seven months pregnant if i'm not mistaken yes i'm 29 weeks pregnant so yeah not much longer to go <laughs> so what what is the what is the timeline then when can your uh husband get some time off and, and make his way over that's sort of up in the air i mean i think for us we have the question of whether he would be allowed to quarantine with me in the first place because uh last time he attempted to cross they stated that he would not be allowed to because mm. i'm considered a vulnerable person despite the fact that i'm clearly interacting with patients on a daily basis but my husband is apparently a large risk to me um so <laughs> uh, i don't know but i i called so i called CBS, cbsa yesterday and asked them if this was still on their list and they could not give me an answer and that i should talk to public health so i called public health yesterday and then they told me they don't know if i'm on the list like you know pregnancy is a list of vulnerable people but they'll call me back in five business days oh they called gosh. me back fortunately and then they told me pregnancy is not on the list but they have no idea where cbsa ever got that list to initially tell my husband that so there's this big question and they said their general statement is that if you have an underlying health condition, which I mean, anything could be an underlying sure. health condition, how is it up to the CBSA border agent to determine what is a vulnerable condition in this case? Like what medical training are they having that allows them to decide what makes someone vulnerable to coronavirus? That, yeah, I, that, I don't know. I, I only have about I only have about 20 seconds, uh, Ashley. Wh what what do you guys I mean, what will it be like when you're reunited? I imagine he just wants to feel your pregnant belly and see make sure you're doing OK. Yeah, I think he's really excited about seeing me um, and really excited about seeing our dogs. So I hope that it happens soon and I hope it happens for other people soon, like yeah. not just people who are married in common law. Yeah, I do, I do, too. And I hope it works out when he finally does make it to the border. Fingers crossed. Uh, thank you for talking with us. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, that's Dr. Ashley Cook in Windsor, Ontario. She is hoping to see her husband again soon. We are keeping an eye on coverage in Houston. Special live coverage of George Floyd's funeral from Houston starts in just a few minutes. I'm Rosemary Barton.